Thank you for joining us on another episode of Latter Gay Stories Podcast. I'm your host, Kyle Ashworth, and you are at the intersection of sexuality and reality, where it meets at LDS Street and LGBTQ Avenue. If you are watching on our video version, you will see brand new digs. You are, this is our first episode in our brand new studio, uh, the Latter Gay Stories Studio, so we're Super excited to have you uh, participate, and if you are uh, listening on our audio version, you probably notice a little bit different uh, sound quality because all of our audio equipment was upgraded as well in our new digital studio. So we're super excited to have you along with us. If you are watching on the video version, you can jump in on the chat below. So uh, join in. Let's have a real-time conversation uh, in this interview and discuss some of these things as we uh, venture down another story. So thank you for giving us an hour of your time to better understand the experiences of the LGBTQ community. But most importantly, um, we want you to, to uh, share this message and get something from it. So if you are on the video version. If you're watching through YouTube or Facebook, we invite you to like our channel, our Facebook uh, page, and subscribe to our YouTube channel as well. We have uh, this episode and many others on the channel, so feel free to kick off your shoes and stay a while and take advantage of, of the opportunity of learning uh, through so many, so, so many different stories. Without further ado, I want to welcome um, to the podcast a super, super story. You're going to fall in love with Paige as uh, you listen to her story. Um, it's a story about family. It's a story about coming out later in life. It's a story about better understanding who and what you are. It's a story about defying the odds and taking control uh, through personal revelation and finding your own uh, personal happiness. So, without further ado, I want to welcome to the podcast, uh, Paige Petruka. Hello. Thank How's you. How's it going? Thank you. I'm so glad to be here. I'm so uh, excited to have you here in studio. Not only um, are you our inaugural um, interviewee in the Latter Gay Stories uh, podcast episode, but we should also talk a little bit about what you're doing here in Utah. You're not just here yeah. to record our our interview. Right. <laughs> right. I did live in Utah for a while, originally from Pennsylvania. Um, I got my PhD in theater uh, in 2014. And so I came back to Utah and I was adjunct professor at BYU and UVU, as so many of us do. But there was no full time job here. So I ended up, I moved to Kansas. I was there for three years and now I live in Texas teaching at a community college. Um, I've done uh, some film work. I'm in, <laughs> I'm in the occasional holiday film uh, where I play a woman who serves coffee in a diner and done it in so many things. So I got the opportunity to film uh, another Christmas movie and we just wrapped on Monday. So I figured I'd just hang around here, stay with brothers and parents and stay for Christmas. But yeah, I got, I, <laughs> funny story. I messaged Kyle and said, Hey Kyle, I'm going to be in Utah. Maybe we could have lunch. And Kyle of course said, how about an interview? <laughs> and then, then I proceeded to freak out and now I'm here. There's so. no such thing as a lunch around here. It nope, is, I guess not. If you're coming in from out of state and you have a remarkably normal or extraordinary <laughs> story, you will come in and we're going to have lunch and we're, we're going to have... We're here, yes. Yeah, what, what does the, uh, the Tabernacle Choir say? It's music and the spoken word here. Love it. Or lunch and the spoken word. I'll take it. Okay, that's not, okay good. I'm so, not singing for you because I do, I sing off key very badly, but it's also fun, so... <laughs> So originally from Utah, Pennsylvania, uh, Pennsylvania. Yes. Uh, the occasional jump in here to Utah and then uh, currently in Texas as mm -hmm. a professor. Let's bring the audience up to speed. Tell us a little bit more about you. Um, sure. Where you are family wise. In, uh, so in, where do I fit? Siblings, okay. So I and, am the second um, oldest, the only daughter. I have an older brother and three younger brothers. Um, started our lives back in Pennsylvania. Um, my parents are from a very, we're, we're all from a very small coal mining town in central PA. My father was a football coach when he was getting his master's and doctorate. He coached at BYU. He coached at Penn state assistant coach. So I grew up around sports, you know, and started playing basketball and that was going to be my life. And then when I was a junior in high school, I discovered theater and that was it. Sorry. Bye-bye. <laughs> I just did theater. Um, so worked for a while, supported myself. I did go on a mission, um, but I got my doctorate later in life. You know, I went when I was like 41, um, and 
and oh, I just gave my age away. Oh boy, I'm 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 only 29 somehow. I don't I don't know how that <laughs> <It's> works. Perpetual. <laughs> I'm a professional 29-year-old. We row the same boat. That's, love it. Love it. I'm I'm in eternally 30. Love I'm it. Convinced love it. myself of that. Good. Um, acting. I teach script analysis. I teach theater history, theater appreciation, voice, um, and we. I just directed a show. It's been a whirlwind two weeks. I directed a show. We performed. We struck. I started the drive here to Utah, and I wanted to drive because I have a, an adorable boxer by the name of Willow. Hello, Willow. I love you, puppy. Uh, <laughs> if I'm going to play this for her, and she'll get all excited. Um, so drove two days. I had one day of rest, and then we started shooting. So and then wrapped on Monday, and here I am. Let's let's jump back um, because I know part of your story, um, and so many stories that we feature here on Latter Day Stories. Um, has an intersection with Mormonism. Mm -hmm. Your intersection really started when your parents joined the church when you were two years old. Mm -hmm. So you've had a long history of, right. of being a member of the church and having the church's influence right. um, in your experience. So let's um, kind of combine those, those sure. two. Let's start with the influence of the church in your life, but also let's talk a little bit about the time or mm -hmm. times where you thought, I'm different. There's right. something about me that's different. Right. Yeah. Um, my parents, they wonderful humans, honestly, and they they joined the church like like you said when I was two. Um, they didn't know much, and it's just basically everything that they heard from their leaders that they needed to do, they did. Right? You need to have family on home evening. Well, what's that? Well, it's this. Oh, well, okay. Well, we're gonna do it. And so they were very faithful, and so I was raised, you know, very, very faithful. Uh, our family is the only, we're the only members because, uh, you know, aunts, uncles, cousins, they never uh, joined the church, so we were kind of the only ones. Um, and, you know, I would say I was a tomboy when I was young. Like, I was really liked my brother's toys, <laughs> right? I did not like dolls. Don't you dare buy me a doll because, uh-uh. I did love stuffed animals and, you know, but I would find myself roughhousing with my brothers. It's just what I did. Um, of course, my mom <laughs> always tried to put me in the little bows and whatnot. <laughs> Let's just think you look real girly. Uh, and I didn't like that. <laughs> but, you know, whatever. Um and then I think, so I just kind of grew up, and I, I remember when I was 10, I was, the aside from my older brother, Jim, I was the best football player on the block. You know, you have a father who's a football coach. You learn a few things. I was really good. I was quite good back in the day. <laughs> so, but then when I was 11, we were living in Indiana at the time. My mom was in Young Women, and I was just getting ready to go into Young Women, and I I felt something for this uh, this girl that was a my maid, and just she sang she sang alto, and I had never heard anybody sing alto before, and I just remembered feeling something so different that I had never really I couldn't really put my finger on it. It was just not it wasn't a crush for a boy; it was a crush for a girl, and and I didn't know what that meant though. I couldn't really put a label on it other than. I just wanted to be around her. <laughs> I wanted to listen to her sing all the time and hang out. and uh, So that was that. And then our family moved to Wyoming. And we moved all over the place. So uh, lived in Wyoming, and I played basketball. This was, of course, before I discovered theater. Played basketball. And then, <laughs> then when I was 14, and I think you read this part of it. <laughs> this is such a funny story. I love it because... It shows how innocent I was and how I just didn't get what was going on. Um, we had two junior highs, and we were in ninth grade. At 10th grade, you merged into the high school. And so I had met the basketball players from the other junior high. And the, <laughs> the other junior high, was they were quite a bit better than we were, which is fine. But we thought, oh, we'll be friends because we're going to... We're going to play together in high school, and it's going to be great. So it was, it was during the summer, and this gal, we had connected, and and she called me and said, oh, I'm going to come over on my moped. And I was like, yeah, cool, let's do that. So she came over on her moped, and she's like, get on, you know, let's take a ride. Okay, so this was very awkward for me, and I, you know, you get the hands, and you're like, what do I, I don't know what to do, <laughs> right? So I kind of, I put them around her waist, but they were so stiff, like, ah, but I, 
at the same time, it was like, okay, this is nice. This is nice. This is really cool. So we went on a ride, and then she <laughs> came and dropped me off. And she said, she said, I like the way you had your hands around my waist. It was sexy-like. Okay, I'm ninth grade. I never used the word sex or sexy. I didn't know even, I didn't even really, I mean, I understood what it meant, but. Ninth grade and Mormon. Ninth grade and Mormon. And so she we're not said, talking no. about any of these taboo topics, nope, right? Nope, and, and she's like, it was, it was sexy-like. And my response was, thank you, <laughs> because I didn't know what else to say. I just said, thank you. And she went on her way, and that was, that was really it. Um, I thought about her a lot. Um, I did try to have boyfriends, you know, and we'd, you know, we'd kiss, and it was like, well, that's all right, whatever. <laughs> didn't really, it was fine. It was what everybody did. So it was at that time that I thought, hmm, I'm pretty sure everybody has feelings for other people of the same sex. It's just a thing. We just, you know, push it down and don't worry about it. Everybody feels this way. Psh. That was my very innocent mind trying to reconcile the LDS faith. And at the time, and I, I do have to apologize because I was so cruel to people who were gay, which doesn't make any sense because I was feeling those very same things. But in the 80s, there, it was just a very different generation. You know, it was, there was misunderstandings, there was judgment. I think this is really good territory because people, people connect with this type of discussion. Yeah. yeah. Do you recall some of the cruel, what you yeah. say now are cruel things? Yes, I just, you know, there was always the whispers, oh my gosh, he's gay. Oh my gosh, that's so disgusting. And it was gross, and that person was, you know, really ostracized. Uh, and I even, when I was, I spent my first couple of years in college getting my bachelor's at BYU, which that's another story in and of itself. But one of my friends, her brother came out, and I was awful. And I said, and I'm ashamed of this. I said, um, oh my gosh, anybody who's gay, they have something, something mentally wrong with them. That is what I said, Kyle. And all along, I'm feeling these very same things and just shoving them down. We talk about internalized homophobia, and I think that is super, super real. And it's, it's a yeah. discussion that I think more of us should have yeah. um, because it is one of the ways that we can just inwardly, in an inward fashion, I guess, mm -hmm. outwardly try to connect with who and what we are. And I think it's real. Well, it's real because, like you said, we're, we're trying to figure this out and we're trying to reconcile it. And sometimes we take the wrong path to do that. And, and I, I look back and I think, what on earth was I thinking? And, but that was very much the mentality in the faith. That was very much the mentality of, uh, you know, the people at, at BYU and in my high school. Um, so, you know, and I, I'm saying this a little early. I was going to wait to the end of the podcast to, to say this, but I know I hurt people on the way. And to them, I say, I am so sorry. And I hope that you can forgive me and my, oh, how do I word this? My lack of faith in you, in my, uh, my judgments, the, the inability that I had to see other people for who they are as they are, instead of trying to make them fit a mold, which is what I tried to do my, for myself for 44 years. I think that's really great, um, great advice and, and a good lesson yeah. for each of us to learn. So where, where do you move from being Lloyd Christmas on the back of the mo moped to <laughs> <laughs> finally okay. starting to better understand so, who Paige okay. is? Okay. Well then, so, you know, graduated from high school, went on to BYU and, you know, it just, at the time, BYU was not, I was really trying to get, do the theater there because that was my thing because I, I took theater as my a junior in high school and never looked back and that was it. That was going to be it. And I was, at the time, it was a real struggle to break into performances at BYU unless um, you were a junior or a senior. And, and I just, I took all the classes and I tried to, I did the mass club performances and just nobody was saying, hey. Um, 
and at the time I had the roommate and she had the brother who came out and actually interestingly enough she came out later <laughs> too <laughs> so it was like ha <laughs> wow <laughs> that's funny um spent two and a half years really fighting at BYU to just break into theater and I and I kept trying to date men and it was it was one of those where you know you you date a guy and you know within five minutes of the date I'm zoning out thinking about other things and not even listening to him and what he has to say because it's not interesting <laughs> but Kyle you're very interesting you know don't uh, <laughs> don't take that um, anyway so I wasn't having success at BYU so I ended up getting a scholarship at Southern Utah University to do uh, forensics to do speech and theater so left BYU Went down to Southern Utah. Before we leave BYU, what what, time, what years were you at BYU? 86 to 89. So did you, you knew of some of the history at BYU regarding what, what they were doing? I didn't at the time. I know now, but I didn't then. No. Um, what was the, what was so you're not out, obviously, no. on campus. I'm not. I don't even think I'm any. I think I'm a very straight person who, like everyone else, has feelings for the same sex. Just because that's how life is, Kyle. You just all feel that. <laughs> that was what I thought. And so I'm thinking. So in the '80s, we're talking Holland is your president. Yep. Jeffrey R. Holland is your uh, mm -hmm. president at BYU, mm -hmm. um, and he took over after um, Dallin H. Oaks mm -hmm. uh, was the president. But no talk, no buzz. Was there any campus discussion? Do you remember at all about group, that? Not in my group. Nothing. Really, the only one was my roommate who told me about her brother, and and that was when I was very mean. Yeah. So then you travel down to so go down to Southern, to Southern Utah. Utah, and wouldn't you know it? Bada bing, bada boom, fell in love with a woman, and that was. I mean, it was love. It was. I fell hard. Up to that point, I you know I knew I had little crushes on women, but define that. What is love? What what did love feel like to a young college? Love to person? to me, it felt I kept trying to force it with men, and you know, in your mind, you think, oh, this must this is just how it feels, but then when you fall in love with the right gender, <laughs> you know, all of a sudden you think, this is what I should have been. Well, I say should have. Let me do air quotes. What I should have been feeling with men, but didn't. But this is very real. This is not counterfeit. This is not Satan getting into my mind. And I also need to say this is very important. When I first realized this when I was 11 and had that crush on that girl who was a my maid, there was no porn. I didn't know any. I didn't know any people who were gay. I didn't even really know gay. I didn't know what. <laughs> I didn't know what it meant. So there was no influence from anything other than true, authentic feelings deep inside that was real. Yeah, and what you're bringing up is some of the traditional, and and we're not even talking about just what the church was teaching at the time. Right. But on a national stage, um, that parents are to blame for yep. rearing gay children. That uh, masturbation or pornography were right. gateways to uh, the creation of this that then in a religious token it was um, if you weren't attending church enough if you weren't praying enough if you exactly. weren't reading your scriptures these are all reasons to justify why mm -hmm. someone uh, has an alternative sexuality mm -hmm. yeah and that none of that was me none of that I had a wonderful relationship with both my father and my mother. I had a great relationship with my brothers. I liked looking pretty. I didn't like being girly and have my hair in pigtails and little bows. I didn't like that, but you know, not every woman does and that's okay. Um, so I look back and I think there was, there was nothing. You can't blame it on anyone, anything just, and there really isn't any need to blame. It's just what it is. It's just how it is and it's okay. But I didn't know that. So I fell in love. I fell hard <laughs> in, you know, this was 89, 90 in Southern Utah and did not know what the crap to do with that, you know. So there was so much guilt. You know, it wasn't a good relationship. We did, we were girlfriends for a little minute and, well, more than a minute, but you know what I'm saying. Uh, it was just, 
there was so much guilt on my end and and truthfully we were not really good together um but i you know i loved her so i had to reconcile the guilt that i loved her but we really weren't good together and how do i do this and i just want to go on a mission right because all my brothers were getting ready to go and going and i needed to go on a mission do you think the mission was part of the ticket out of that relationship? hundred percent. One hundred percent, Kyle. I don't, that was good. Very observant, my friend. Yeah, for me it was. It was like, how am I, how am I going to get out of this? And so, you know, took, went to the bishop, took care of it, um, went through probation because I just was going to go on a mission. And of course I told no one, no, I didn't tell anyone about this because I was so ashamed. You didn't tell anyone in your friend circle, but... Or family. What about, so you said you went through a disciplinary council. Right. What, what was that experience like? Well, it was, um, it was actually very loving. It was surprisingly, they were, they were great. Although they did allude to the fact that because I had such a strong testimony, they were surprised that the answer was only probation because they, in their minds, they thought I should have been more harshly punished, I guess. But in that council, you did come out. To my bishop. To yes. your bishop, yeah. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> but no one else. Nope, nope. Just shove that right back down. Frightening, terrifying. Terrifying. 100% terrifying. Oh my gosh. But I also thought that. Maybe, maybe I, in my mind, thought it was a phase that I wasn't going to fall in love with any other woman. I was going to fall in love with a man. And it's funny because I, I prayed for two things. I never prayed for this to be taken away from me because I knew that's not how things worked. I know a lot of people did that, and that's, I, that's fine if that's your journey. I support you. But for me, I knew I could never ask that. So I prayed for two things. I prayed that... Number one, I wouldn't be attracted to any of my companions. And number two, that I could please just be attracted to one man. All I needed, that that I just needed one. One man to be attracted to. <laughs> okay. That's not too much to ask, is it, Kyle? It's the same thing I asked for. One woman. No, one oh, man. One man. <laughs> oh, I gotcha. Okay. <laughs> I gotcha. Well, now I am asking for one woman, but whatever. That's another story. Um so anyway, we got that taken care of, and I went on my mission to New Jersey, and it was it was amazing. And I I've listened it to, I think all of the podcasts on this show, and and that seems to be a common theme that the mission is a great time. It's a really great time because you're not worrying, nobody's pressuring you to date. I'm not worrying about anything. The only, the only thing I'm worried about is please, please don't let me be attracted to a companion, which I was not. So if any of my companions are watching, I wasn't attracted to you, but I did love you as a friend. Thank you. That's my, that's my soapbox. Uh <laughs> Interestingly, though, like that little soapbox actually means a lot to former companions yeah. of LGBTQ uh, Companions. Yeah. The, I've run into that over and over and over again. When when someone does come out, there's just that little un. They're they're a little this, nervous. This little fear. And, yeah. And I Nothing think that's, to be that's afraid of. Super honest and just candid. Thank you. About that experience. Well, I, there was a sister I was very attracted to, and I, on one hand, I just so wanted to be her companion because I wanted to be around her all the time. We never were made companions, and I was so thankful for that. Not that anything would have happened, but it just would have been harder for me emotionally to navigate that. But boy, I loved being around her. <laughs> Let me tell you, that was fun. <laughs> we, had, we had a really good time. So my mission was absolutely wonderful. Um, I had terrific companions, and I have actually come out to maybe three of them, and they've shown me nothing but love and kindness. One is in Scotland, and she's amazing and terrific. And then I have two here in the United States, and they have just been fabulous, and I couldn't ask for more. The old um, Mormon rhetoric surrounding this topic is that a mission is part of the process to ungay yourself. Right. Mission, marriage, children was yep. kind of the, the three-step process that was um, chosen. In your experience as a young missionary— um, and I think it was pretty clear that you went on your mission um, in order to try to begin that sorting process. 
but also as a way to better define and understand who you are. Um, was there ever a point in your mission or prior to your mission where you said, this was going to help me, this is going to fix me, this will change me um, from, um, from some of these feelings that are Sure. Oh, oh, of course. You know, you're, you're dedicating your life to God. And again, just bless me with one man. That's, that was my prayer. One man. Just that's, I don't, I don't even have to meet him on the mission. And I went when I was a little older, I was 25 when I went. Um, what was hard on the mission was everybody's like, I'm gonna, when I'm done, I'm gonna go to college. And I had already gotten my bachelor's degree. So I thought, I'm going to go to work. <laughs> I'm going to find a man. I don't know. So that was my, that was what I was, I was nervous about coming off the mission because I didn't know what, what was coming. I didn't know how I was going to get to the goal yeah. that I thought I needed to get to. So get off my mission and, <laughs> oh, oh, Kyle, this was not in these the little, you, you don't know some of this. I had the worst dating experiences in my life. Huh. And I, I look back on it now and I really think, I totally believe that Heavenly Father loves me for who I am, but I couldn't see that. He accepts me. Uh, there is a place for me at his table, 100%. I didn't believe that though for a long time. So I'm praying, one man, please, please, please. So I, I start dating after my mission. Oh my gosh, the horrendous dates that I had horrendous. I can trump any other bad date with my stories. And it was like Heavenly Father was going, okay, you want a man? Here you go. <laughs> You're not going <laughs> to like it, but there you go. I dated a guy. And if he's ever listens to this, I am not going to out you, but he had no money. And I was like, that's fine. We'll just, we'll go to the planetarium. This, I was living in Salt Lake attending a singles ward at the time. Let's go to the planetarium. It'll be free. And, and, and during, I found myself, before he really started telling me about himself, I was like zoning out. He was talking to me about himself, blah, 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 blah. And my mind is like, well, let's see, what should I, what time should I get up tomorrow? And what should I have for breakfast? And then I came back around and I, and he goes, okay, well, I'm, I'm going to tell you why I don't have a lot of money. I said, okay, <laughs> bracing myself. He said, well, I, I work with odor removal, and um, I was trying to remove odors from this house, and um, the chemicals I used got too close to the fuel line, and I blew up the house, and the family is suing me. What? <laughs> so, uh-huh. See what I'm saying? This yeah. is the man. This, this is the man is, you served a mission for. This is the man for me. This is the man you prayed for. You, Gosh. You knocked doors for. I sure as heck did. And then I was like, that, this is not, no, 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 no. So there were many others after that. Um, so I got off my mission when I was 27, another journey. I'm not finding a man. Okay, what's next? You know what? I'm going to get my master's in theater because I was working full time and then just doing theater at night. And that wasn't fulfilling me. I'll get my master's. So I went to Utah State and got my master's when I was like 31-ish. And this is an interesting thing. Ugh, this was another unfortunate thing. Um, I, but it's profound, and I wanna, that's why I want to bring it up. My second year, um, a dear family friend in California said, hey, there's this guy, and he's going through a divorce, and I think you two would be really great. Well, the closeted me <laughs> said, okay, yeah, all right, let's do this. So he and I wrote emails for like a year and we'd call each other on the phone for about a year. So I graduated with my master's in theater. You said that's Utah State University in Logan. In right? Logan. Yep. So I graduated and, and we had been writing for a year and he said, well, why don't you come to California? And I said, okay. <laughs> so we planned it and I was going to stay with the family friend down there. And he and I would, we would do family things right together. So I had high hopes. I really did, Kyle. I had high hopes. And I remember I flew down there, and the second I saw him in the airport, I knew. The second I saw him, I had no feelings for him. I couldn't. Even though in my mind, in the year we were writing, oh, yes, it's going to work, it's going to work, and it didn't work. So then I have to have three days <laughs> with this guy. Ended up having a blast with the family that I was staying with. 
and things just didn't with him were just not they just they just weren't and the most profound thing that happened on that trip was we decided to spend a day in San Francisco because they lived very close and so we loaded up uh, this this couple and their daughter and me and this guy in this we packed ourselves in this tiny little car drove to San Francisco and all the while, I'm just battling with myself. I've got it, Paige, come on. Oh, you got to get out of this. This is not the right guy. And we went into a store, and it had posters all over. And I saw this poster of these two women lying in bed looking at each other. And just, and I'm going to get emotional, just that picture, I felt so much more from that picture than I did from this man, that I'm supposed to be attracted to these men, right? And I felt more from a picture. And it was a very profound experience. And, and it was that, and it kind of got me in a depression after that. And I, you know, I kind of said no to this guy. <laughs> it's not gonna work, I'm sorry. Oh, well, we can still try. Nope, not, not gonna happen. So that profound moment could not, I could not let go of it, and I spent my, you know, my mid-30s and late 30s really wrestling with what this means, still shoving everything down, because that's what you do. You shove it down, and I shoved things for so many decades. I want to try to, I want to kind of dig into that territory sure. just a little bit and better, and try to understand where you are at as a Latter-day Saint also, uh, because it seems like all of those Church influences are still prodding you to Absolutely. straight and narrow, be yep. something that you're not. Um, like you say, just just bury it, mm -hmm. get rid of it, don't acknowledge it. Nope, nope. It's not. It's not. It's not a thing. You can't say the word gay. You can't do it because you're not. Um, you know, I had a friend come out to me, and I was like, No, no, you're not gay. <laughs> no, you're not. You are not. I had another friend come out. Nope, you're not. You're not. Okay, just just got to push it down, and then you know they didn't, and and of course I was more devastated. And I I just, again I'm ashamed of some of these thoughts, but I thought to myself, gosh, am I the only person who has these feelings that's going to make it through this life without being scathed by you know <laughs> homosexuality? I really thought that, which was just a shame. Well, I think the thing that I, is most prevalent is nobody wants to be a failure. Right. And for so many in religious organizations um, to choose this, and I air quote that. You have to air quote it because it, it ain't chosen. It ain't choosing. Yeah, that means that you have in many terms failed, many different terms. Yep. Uh, even, I mean, scripturally, you're, we're talking about a Spencer W. Kimball era, a Miracle of Forgiveness era, where all of that, that messaging was right. said, saying, like, if you want happiness and eternal life, you will do this and mm -hmm. you will not do this. And, and that rigidity in religion yep. does that to a person. It does. And all, all through my thirties, I, you know, watched my brothers all get married, start to have children. Um, my cousin back in Pennsylvania, she got married. And I even remember I called her on the phone and said, do you think I'm a failure? <laughs> She goes, no, why, why are you saying that? And I said, well, you know, everybody's gotten married but me. And she said, no, not at all. And, and I hadn't come out to them. I hadn't come out to my family. I hadn't come out really to anyone other than the few select people that, you know, my girlfriend, obviously, and then, you know, the bishop. And so the, my 30s were very, very hard. Um, but then it became, and this is interesting, I, I got a second patriarchal blessing. My first one I got when I was really young, <laughs> and it talked about marrying young and having children in this life. Okay, so you can't, you know how people are with their patriarchal blessings. They try to be like, well, maybe that meant after this life. No, 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 no. It was saying young life, here, in mortality, getting married, having children. That didn't happen. So... Part of this, you know, depression and how am I going to deal with this? I went to my bishop and I didn't tell him that part of it, but I said, you know, I'm, I'm, can I get, I had heard of people getting a second patriarchal blessing. So met with my bishop, I met with my stake president, he and I sat down and read my first patriarchal blessing together and he just goes, yeah, I think you need a second one. <laughs> so, 
So it was great. This may be crazy. I have never heard of a do over. Yeah. A do over. Yeah. I got a do over. Patriarchal blessing. I got a do over. And for those who are unfamiliar with Mormon ter terminology, a patriarchal blessing is um, there is a, a patriarchal leader in Mormonism called a patriarch who is kind of a modern day, what do we call him, Nostradamus? Yes. A very, I think that's perfect. Very modern day Nostradamus who is supposed to kind of give you an outline of what your life experiences would look like if, and there's always this big if, if you follow, if you pray, pay, and obey, if you do all the right things, yep. Yep. then this patriarchal blessing will come true. Great. So you had one. I had one. Obviously, you didn't do all the right things because you were uh, yes. no longer younger with children. And Did not, none of that happened. So it was a do-over. So I got a do-over. They don't, they don't say your lineage in the lineage in the second one, you know, they, but okay. So this actually ended up being really cool because it spoke about education, which I knew I wasn't in the career I wanted. I needed to find a way to do theater full time because it made me so happy I'm pushing papers and doing this and that and the other. And if I'm not going to be married and have kids, I need to do something that I love. It talked about my education, and then it did talk about, and this I love, and I'm going to share it, and I hope it's okay. I know people say, don't share it. It's so personal. But I'm going to because I loved it, and it did talk about um, finding the right individual at the right time. It didn't say man. It didn't say woman. It said individual. Am I reading too much into that? Perchance. I don't know. But it meant something to me that Heavenly Father was like, yeah. She's just got to chill out. It's okay. Individual. You'll find the right individual at the right time. And that brought me a lot of peace. It also mentioned my posterity, <laughs> which <clears throat> I don't know how that works. But actually, I do. Um, some, of I, some of my nieces have my name or my middle name as their name. And just two months ago, one of my nieces, who I had come out to last year, named her baby, gave her daughter my name as her middle name and that to me was that part of my patriarchal blessing coming true that i do have posterity even though i've never birthed any children i have posterity and that means so much to me so and so much of this while closeted i know and still burying this page yes the real page the real page where the heck is she well let me tell you kyle <laughs> then comes Texas Tech University, which I, after the second patriarchal blessing and getting your education, I knew I needed to get my doctorate. I, at first I was like, do I get an MFA, Master of Fine Arts, or do I get a doctorate? Well, doctors get paid more. We're higher up on the list when we get hired. So, and Texas Tech, and that was, so I just, and it was miraculous that there was a purpose to me going to Texas Tech. I, I knew that. I had prayed about it and it was very specific. I, I was like, Heavenly Father, I just I don't know where to go. I don't know what to do. And I was guided to go at midnight, go sit at my computer. Okay, so I sat at my computer. And then I was guided to open up Google. So I'm open up Google. There we go. And the, the word Texas popped into my head. And I was like, OK, PhDs in theater in Texas. And Texas Tech popped up. And I was like, well, that's OK. So I went, and it, it was the greatest thing. It was very hard to do because I had to, you know, leave my life here in Utah, move to Texas, meet new friends, and the most incredible, that was really the start of Paige becoming Paige for so many reasons. I met incredible friends. I, okay, I'll I won't, I'm not going to get too jumpy towards the end of it. Let's back up a Yay, little bit. Yay, because I wanted yeah. to jump yeah, into the we many, got, we many gotta, reasons. We gotta talk about that. Yeah, I so, think that's relatable. First year was fine, I, I and I made this incredible friend, Kristen, and I told Kristen I'd give a shout out to her. Kristen, I love you, girl. You're the best. Um, first year, there were only six PhD students that first year and about eight or nine MFA students, but we all are taking a lot of the same classes, and so I you know, made a lot of friends. And then the next year, <laughs> this woman came into the program and again i fell so hard for her oh, oh gosh it was ridiculous i just and but i did what i always did i was just and i was pushing 
emotionally so hard, pushing, 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 pushing. And then all of a sudden, about two months after I met her, um, I developed this bizarre condition. Now, mind you, I was pushing those feelings down harder than I think I ever have in my whole life. I was shoving them down so hard. All of a sudden, I noticed that I would, you know, I'd start to eat. And like after two bites, I would feel as full as I had eat, as if I'd eaten a Thanksgiving meal. You know how you feel so uncomfortably painful, nauseous after eating Thanksgiving? It's delicious and you love it. Daily. But you're sick. I felt that after just one or two bites of food. And when it first started happening, I thought, well, this is, it'll go away. And it went on for a good two, three months. And I, I just couldn't eat. And I didn't understand. And at the same time, I'm having these feelings for this woman. And I'm shoving it down and shoving it down and shoving it down. So, you know, you go to Google and you're like, ooh, can't process food <laughs> or whatever. So... I, this term came up and it was called gastroparesis. And I thought, well, what is that? So I went to my doctor and I said, I think I have gastroparesis. And she goes, no, you don't. Because you are not a drug abuser and you don't have diabetes. And that's what happens to people who have those struggles. So she sent me to I had a gastro doctor and he sent me for a test and I had to eat radioactive eggs. <laughs> and I lied down on this table and this machine just scanned me for an hour and a half watching food process. So come to find out I do have gastroparesis. So I said to my doctor, why do I have it? He said, I, I, I don't know. And then I suddenly put two and two together and I thought I am sure shoving these feelings so hard down that my body is rejecting me. My body is not rejecting. My body's fighting me. My body's saying, okay, if you're going to do this, I'm going to do this. Okay. This is how physically it broke me. And I realized that nobody had to tell me. I knew, I knew what was going on. But what did that mean? Well, about the same time, I Learn about Ty Mansfield, who is my neighbor that's two blocks away, and he's lived two blocks away from me for the last two years. And I learned that he wrote some books. And all of a sudden, this is where I can finally try to reconcile things. Yeah, and let's, let's fill that in a little bit. Ty is um, one of the co-founders of North Star. Mm -hmm. um, he and the book in... It was Voices of, Voices Hope, of Hope that came out at that time. Right around then. Okay, and the, so the Voices of Hope project was just a soft focus highlight of Latter Day Saints who were making um, had completely or in if you watch the movies, the the videos had bridged this mm -hmm. chasm between mm -hmm. being gay and Mormon or transgender and Mormon, um, and so he also kind of become a little bit of a poster person. Um, 100%. In Mormon circles, because his methods of correlating these two seemingly different worlds mm -hmm. um, was the new thing, mm -hmm. sometimes the next best thing. Yeah. And, and that was, I would say that was the first bridge for me. It was like, oh my gosh, I can talk about this. And so <laughs> I read the book, I watched all the videos, and I was like, thinking in my mind, you know, one of these days I'm going to do a video <laughs> for Voices of Hope. We talked about this. Mm -mm. I'm going to do a video for Voices of Hope and I can, I can just be celibate for the rest of my life. But then another thing happened. I was in another play with a woman and I, I wasn't attracted to her, but we were friends and she played my daughter in this play and my character was very, she was an old woman, she was very broken. And in uh, the dress rehearsal, I, we were sitting down on stage, and she reached over, and she just put her hand on my back. And now, mind you, I hadn't had any physical nothing for many, 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 many years. And she just touched my back. And I remember thinking, oh, my gosh, that feels so nice. 
And so over the next few nights, over the, the week and a half that we did the play, I would I remember thinking, God, I just, I can't. And as soon as she put her hand on my back, I, I just felt okay. So all of these little pieces are coming together. Thai, we have gastroparesis, we have attraction to a woman in the department, we have someone touching me on the back. Oh my gosh, maybe I'm not supposed to live celibate and never have any love and affection the rest of my life, but wait, Ty's saying something else. And so again, I say that was my first bridge. So in my third year, my third year of getting my doctorate, um, I, finally, <laughs> I finally mustered the courage to tell my friend Kristen first before I went and talked to Ty. I think, I think that's how it went. <laughs> and it was again after watching all of the Voices of Hope videos, the term same-sex attraction was okay for me. I couldn't say gay, I couldn't say lesbian, I couldn't say any of that, but I could say same-sex attraction. So I, I go to talk to my friend Kristen. She's got to run in for class and I start crying and Kristen's like, oh my gosh, Paige, what's wrong? And I'm sobbing uncontrollably, uncontrollably. <laughs> and, and she has this pained look on her face like my friend is something horrific has happened. So I, I get out the words, I have same-sex attraction, <laughs> right? <laughs> I'm just sobbing. And honestly, Kristen looks at me and she goes, so? <laughs> she said, I thought you killed someone. I was about to go grab a shovel and uh -huh. we were going to bury the body. This is what, it, what this is nothing. And I looked at her like, you don't think I'm disgusting? And she said, no, what? Nothing is wrong with you. So that was the first time someone had ever said, nothing is wrong with you, to my face. And so that was, okay, so now I can talk to Ty. So I, go, I call up Ty, can I come over? You know, can I talk to you please, Ty? Sure. So, and he had young kids at the time and he had, uh, you know, Danielle was there. And so he just wanted us to talk in his living room and Danielle was walking in and out. And I didn't want Danielle there. I didn't want her to know yet. And so I'm trying to talk to Ty and tell him about me and how I read his book and saw the videos. And, and Ty was wonderful. He really was. Uh, but again, it was this very same sex attraction that, you know, we can still be in the church and this is good. And the other thing they did down in Texas is we had kind of this dinner group that we would meet once a month and talk about experiences. So, so I come out to Ty and Danielle's there walking by and I was like, oh, fine, Danielle, I have same sex attraction. Okay. And she's like, okay, you know. So we start to have this, these lunches and I get, or these dinners and I get more and more comfortable telling my story. It's still very hard. But then they, they said, you have to tell your family. Dun, dun, dun. I've got to tell my family. This was the North Star group that's telling Voices, you? Yeah, this is what Ty, I was like, I think I need to tell my family. And he's like, yeah, you do. And, and he was just very supportive. So I yeah, just spent, kind of a next, next step in yeah, your journey. Yeah, next step. And I hadn't moved back to Utah yet. So this is 2013. And I need to tell the family. I'm going to move back to Utah in a month. And I've got to tell them. Well... <laughs> He'd come up with the whole email thing. Mm. And it's so funny because my first coming out initially was what I call a soft coming out because it was very much, dear family, I love you. I'm the same page you've always known, but I do have same-sex attraction. But I am am going to marry a man, and I am going to stay in the church, and all the things, so don't worry, it's fine, it's fine, it's fine, it's fine. But that was the first bridge. Um, the one thing that I would have done different would be to say, this is what I'm talking about now, I don't know what that's going to look like in a few years, and I think a lot of people today are doing that, which I think is healthy. I, I pigeonholed myself, I did. I just shoved myself into, oops, hello, testing. I shoved myself into a little hole, which I had been doing my whole life, and said, this is, I'm admitting it now. That's it. I'm just admitting it, and now you know, and we're all fine. Um, so that was the first hurdle. And the family was fine, pretty good. They were pretty, they were good, you know. Yeah, let's talk about that for just a minute. What, 
what do you define or how do you define pretty good? What, what, what were the good um, things they did and what were the things that were like well, not so soft landing, so okay. a little more easy? Uh, uh, one of my brothers was completely floored. The, other, the others were like, eh, I kind of figured. And they were fine. And my parents were fine, but they were fine. I think they were fine with the fact that I was going to still marry a man and stay in the church, that I wasn't going to destroy the family unit. I think that's why I call it a soft coming out, right? And as I said, if I, if I could have done it all different, I would say, let me find this out. Let me explore this. I don't know what this means, but I do love you all, and I'm still the same me. Um, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty. I didn't know it was the best I could do at that time. So I moved back, and all of a sudden, I realize that I have admitted it, but I haven't accepted it. I did not accept it. So I, I started to, what, there was a wagon, circle the wagons. There was, that was a thing I went to a couple of times. I did go to a couple of um, North Star activities, and then I, I jumped in and went to affirmation, and it was affirmation when I went, okay, now I'm feeling at home. Now I'm feeling at home. Before we get into affirmation, I, cause I, I just want to touch on one little part that yeah. you keep bringing up this soft landing mm -hmm. because I, I also went through the North star experience as well yeah. through the faith affirming, um, process. Yeah. And I, and I think that is so beautifully put that, that it was a soft landing. Usually people in our situations, when we come out, need a soft place to fall. Yeah. And this is a whole new territory for us. And, and this is the same for a person who identifies as LGBTQ plus mm -hmm. somewhere along the spectrum, but also I've noticed for their family members as well. This is one of yeah. those experiences where family members, they are now completely uh, inundated with new language and terminology and people and experiences and fears. And sometimes we function best when we have a control of the future, when we right. know what's coming ahead. And when this revelation comes out, whether it's your kid or your sister or your brother or yourself, you lose that. Uh, there becomes this new unknown territory, and you, you lose that ability to, to predict the future. So I like what you're talking about in terms of soft landing. Mm -hmm. I, I like this idea that um, some of these faith-affirming resources like North Star, or Circle the Wagons, the church's version of well, it's been Mormon and gay, gays and Mormons, yeah. same-sex attracted, yeah. the, the many different versions that the church has, has put on their website concerning this topic, I think are all excellent examples of soft landings right. to allow you to fall away from tradition and culture into a new world a little bit. But then I like what you're talking about with affirmation because that, that meant something to me too. Um, when I felt like I only needed just a life jacket right. when I was out in this ocean somewhat on my own, Affirmation sent a rescue boat. Agreed. They they sent the Carnival cruise ship, and yeah, here were <laughs> all of these people who knew me and could relate to me. So mm -hmm. I just wanted to point that out that I thought that was that was my experience as well. Yeah, it was it was so profound, and it was it was before I had started attending um, Affirmation. I had gone to North Star events. I was you know Ty and I actually moved back to Utah at the same time. Um, and I was going to North Star, and my mom actually came to a North Star event, you know, and it was beautiful. Uh, and then I went to a Circle of the Wagons of, uh, months later, and I ran into Ty, gave him a huge hug, and, and he started saying things that were different from what I believed in my heart, you know. Um, he was, we just, our, I would say our ideologies parted, and I noticed it at that Circle of the Wagons event. Um, so while I will always 100% be grateful to Ty and Danielle and the kind people that they are and the good that they helped me with, that they helped me give, give me this soft landing, I knew that my future wasn't in North Star, which was why I was like, I, I first I thought, I'm going to do a Voices of Hope video, and now, no, I prayed about it, it was wrong, I knew that, I didn't know why, but I'm not making a Voices of Hope video. Okay, I don't know why, but we're not. So, you know, I, I kind of lost touch with Ty 
but again, we'll still always be grateful to him and Danielle. Start attending affirmation. Oh, I am happy as a clam. I learned so many things from this a- these affirmation events. I am over the moon excited. Uh, the one of my very first conference, I was in this group. I don't even remember what the group was, what the you know workshop was. But one man said, he said, you know what? The gay community can't tell me how to be a Mormon, and the Mormon community can't tell me how to be gay. And it was so profound that I thought, oh my gosh, we are all on our own journeys, that we shouldn't pigeonhole ourselves. We shouldn't shove ourselves into a hole. We should be like, ah, okay, what does it look like for me? Well, let's find out. Let's let's experience that. So it was the best thing I could have heard in that moment. I also was hearing people say, you know, Quiet the voices in your head that say, you got to get married to the opposite sex. You got to do this. You got to do that. You're ruining your family if you do this. Quiet all those voices and just start listening to you inside. Again, that was so profound. And so that really began my journey of not just admitting, but accepting, accepting myself. I had to do that. So... I'm living with my parents at this time in my 40s, living in my parents' basement. Um, (laughs) In Utah. In Utah. But I was writing my dissertation. So I was writing my dissertation. I was working hard. I was trying to get a full-time job as a professor. Um, And I watched this special. It was probably on HBO. I don't know. Uh, It was um, the the two men that were fighting to to get to have same-sex marriage um, in 2015. It was actually right before the exclusion policy in November. It was like June-ish, right? They, I watched the special on them because up to that point, gay marriage was wrong. It was out the door, right? It wasn't even an option for me. I watched this special and because I was more open, I thought, it's love. They should be able to marry. <laughs> it's real. It's not fake. It's, it's the poster I saw in Sacramento again. All exactly. Over again. Yeah. It's that. That's real. That reaffirming. Yep. So I figured this was a conversation I needed to have with my parents. And I'm not going to go too much into this because I, I will say, look, it took me 44 years to, to come out per se. Um, I've got to get, I had to give them more time too. And they did the best they could with what they had. But there was a dinner where I said, so I think gay marriage is cool. <laughs> That did not go over well. A week later, <clears throat> another conversation, you know, oh, it's a choice. No, it's not a choice. Oh, this is, uh, there was a conversation with my parents where I just, I just broke down. I broke down and I said, and I remember just slamming my hand on the table and saying, I am so tired of shoving down every feeling again and again and again. And that's how I felt. I was so sick and tired of shoving it. And I still cry every time I talk about it because it was so raw. It was just one of the most raw moments that I'd ever felt in my life. And uh, went downstairs. And shortly after that, my father came down and (laughs) held my hand and he said, I love you. And then about an hour and a half later, my mom came down and she said, "I, I didn't realize until now. And... That was, you know, one of the first steps towards bridging the gap with, you know, my parents and me. And and they're still on a journey, and I'm still on a journey, but that was very poignant and important. And we had to have that conversation, and I had to get it out. I think um, it's important to say, even in your mother's defense, like, yes, and I and I love how you brought up that you've had 44 years to figure out something about Paige, and we have to give our parents and our family members some grace in this space to be able to give them the opportunity to get to speed, to come up to your, to seek your level as well. Um, But I also think it's important to point out that as you referenced earlier, your mom attended some of the conferences with you. Mm -hmm. Like she joined with you and walked with you in, in your experience. And I think that is when someone says, how can I be a good ally? How can I better understand the needs of my queer child, yeah. that's a really great step. And that I can tell um, that meant something to Paige. It did. It did. Um, you know, it was still, we didn't have a ton of conversation. You know, when the, in November 2015, um, that was just bad for so many of us. And I, 
I said to my parents, I said, I'm going to go up and I'm going to walk around Pioneer Park. I think it was that Friday night. And I was up there and I was walking. And um, I told them, I said, I'm going. I'm, this is wrong. You know, I'm going I'm to walk with them. Yeah, and I just wanted to make reference to what you're talking about. In, in the 5th of November, 2015, the church released a policy um, deeming uh, gay Latter-day Saints as apostates. Uh, at first, it was just gay Latter-day Saints. They uh, altered it. They updated it to say gay Latter-day Saints who were in uh, same-gender relationships or marrying, because at that time, the Supreme Court had ruled that same-sex marriage was uh, legal. Mm-hmm. Um, it also prevented their children from being baptized. It prevented them from uh, getting uh, saving ordinances and also naming bless- naming um, blessings, which is an ordinance that's early in um, Mormonism for, for children. It was really tumultuous. It was a very difficult experience for so many people um, who were met at this intersection of, of LDS Street and LGBTQ Avenue, and and for you as well, and for the people who met there in Salt Lake, mm-hmm. um, there was a mass resignation of memberships. Yeah. Um, it was reported that I think on that night alone, five thousand people um, re- uh, resigned their memberships. But uh, Gregory Prince, who's an LDS historian. Um, said that in the aftermath of the November 2015 policy, 60,000 people um, wow. resigned their membership as a result of that policy, specific to that policy. And just right up the hill in the Liberty Wells stake mm-hmm. um, of Salt Lake, right near where you were at, um, 10% of the, there was a stake president there who said 10% of his stake resigned their membership after the no- November 2015 policy was announced. So mm-hmm. it had enormous ra- ramifications. And we're not talking about 60,000 gay Mormons. We're talking about people who just looked at this topic and said, the church is not right. They're not getting this correct in this space. It wasn't the soft landing that we've talked about. Right. Yeah. Um, So that, that was also on the, the journey of acceptance. And it was around this time that I started to feel comfortable enough with uh, coming out to some more people. I, I came out to a niece, and it was the cutest thing. I, I she was attending BYU, and I was still, you know, was working on getting full time work as a theater professor, which is hard to do. FYI, I'm just putting it out there. Um, and I said, "Well, you know, you, you know, I'm gay, right?" And she goes, "I know, and I don't care." Literally like that, and it just warmed my heart. And I have found over the year, over the last few years, the more nieces and nephews that I've come out to, they are my biggest allies. They literally don't care. I had never experienced that in my life. They don't care. Kyle, where were these people (laughs) all these years ago? You know, they don't care. So, okay, jumping ahead a little bit. So I'm still, you know, working on just loving myself and I'm not there yet, but I'm trying and I this is okay, and it's okay, it's okay, it's okay, and I'm attending affirmation. I get full-time work in Kansas at a community college there. So I thought, okay, fresh start, right? I'm going to start over fresh. So 2018, <laughs> fall of 2018, I moved to Kansas, and and I have a friend that she helps me move, and she's wonderful, and thank you for all you have done, my dear. I love you. Um, I... It's a tiny little town in Kansas. And there was this cute shop that I just kept being drawn to. It was just this really cute shop. And I thought, oh, I'm going. And I go up to the door, and there's there's a rainbow sticker on the door. And I thought, oh, these are my people. Oh, my gosh, I found someone. So nobody knows me in this town. I go in. I see the owner, proprietor, my dear friend now. And I was like, hey, I saw your sticker. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> I just told him everything about me. Never met him before. And this poor man, oh, oh, oh okay, uh-huh. I saw your sticker, and this is why. And, and so then I become dear friends with his partner and then another dear friend. So these three taught me how to love myself. And I have to say a shout out to Brian, Ryan, and Daryl. I love you all so much. It was moving to Kansas where it just, they didn't care. Nobody cared. They loved me for me. 
and I ended up speaking at a, at a Pride event, and I was, again, freaking out, and then my picture was in the paper. Oh, Paige, you're in the paper. What? Oh, no. I'm okay. I can do this. Yes, 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 I'm fine. But they helped me just love myself because they were so confident in who they were. So that was, so my three bridges were Ty and Danielle helping me admit affirmation, helping me accept, and then my, my core group in Kansas that helped me learn to love myself. And I will always and forever be grateful for them. I love that. I, I think that's such a beautiful story as it just unfolded, uh, just, a, just a natural progression. Yeah. Um, Sometimes I look back and wonder how much bandwidth we've wasted getting to that point. And you had 44 years of bandwidth you worried about. Mm -hmm. um, but then miraculous things start happening. They, oh where, where, where's, where's Paige today? Like, oh my gosh, Paige is great today. <laughs> I am so good. I have, uh, so, as I said, my nieces and nephews are amazing. Now, and now, as I said, I live in Texas. Um, still making my friends, still finding my people, because I've only been there for a few months. Um, but my nieces and nephews, I have a niece. <laughs> she started a Pinterest page for my one-day wedding, and I am over the moon. She just, we were just talking on the phone one night, and then a few hours later, she texted me, I hope you don't mind, I started a Pinterest page, and it's adorable, and it's, you know, these signs that say, two brides are better than one, and, uh, you know, love is love, and because finally, guess what? There is hope for me to have happiness in a relationship. Yay, I love that. I, I, but you know what? The other thing that always frustrated me was, You'd hear these general authorities speaking in church, and they would talk about, oh, my, my companion, they are the greatest, and oh, that I am so grateful I've become a better person because of my companion, because of my spouse, and I can't wait to spend eternity with them. And you think, you don't even have a clue what you're saying to people like me. You have no idea, because if you did, you wouldn't say things like that, or you would actually understand that everybody needs companionship and love. And I never thought it was a possibility, but I do now, and, I, and I'm hopeful for the future, and I'm excited about this one-day wedding. Um, surprise family members who I didn't even tell I'm doing this. I'm going to find a wife one day, and you're welcome to the wedding. I don't know if you're going to come, but you can. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm happy. I'm healthy. I, I knew that coming here and talking to you would be a big thing. And I knew I wanted to do it. And this time versus Voices of Hope, when I prayed about it, this was right. This was right. And it's, it's, it's good that I'm here. And, and I feel like I can breathe. You know, I think you can relate to that. So many years we, we felt like we couldn't even inhale air, fill up our lungs with life and happiness. We just would take a little bit of breath in because that's all we needed to just get by. But now we can fill ourselves up so full and lead a rich, happy life. And I will tell you what, it took me a long time to figure this out, but there is 100% a place for me at God's table. I will, after this life, he will welcome me, he will love me, and he will sit with me. The gay chapstick lesbian that I am, which is a term that I own and I love. So he will sit with me and he will love me and my Savior will too. I don't doubt that for a second and I hope that anybody who's struggling and you feel like you're not worthy and you're not good, you are, you 100% are, and God loves you for you. Paige, I love that. So beautiful. Thank you. Um, what about some advice? That was so, oh, gosh. There, there was so much there that, that the audience can feel what you're, what you're speaking about. What's your advice to a church leader who just felt that very same thing we just did when you explained that? What is your advice to a church leader who says, but the doctrine or the policy says? I've thought a lot about that. And, you know, people have mentioned this in a sense in, in other podcasts, um, if, if we go back to church doctrine a little bit, you know, we know the story of how the word of wisdom came about. You know, uh, Joseph and the other people were chewing tobacco and spitting them on the floor. This is what you hear in seminary, right? 
chewing tobacco and spitting it on the floor, and there's there's stuff everywhere. And Emma says, "I'm this is awful. I hate cleaning up after this. This is really bothering me." And so Joseph goes and prays, and he gets the word of wisdom. And then we think about um, blacks and the priesthood. This is really bothering me that blacks can't have the priesthood. This is bothering me. So I'm going to take it to God, and I'm going to get an answer. Well, our leaders are not praying for the right things right now. They're, they're not letting it bother them. This isn't, it should bother you that I can't, that you're going to look down on me because I want to be happy and have companionship and not live alone like I have for 54 years. 53, I'm not 54. I'm 53. <laughs> it should bother you. And if it bothers you, then you take it to God. And then, guess what? You're going to get the right answer. But if you're like, oh, those gay people, we just don't know what to do with them. They're so wrong and they're so evil and that's your prayer, you're not going to hear anything. You have to let it bother you. And when you're in that position, you're going to be open. You will be open to hearing what God has to say. That's, that's what I believe and that is what I've come to find out over the years. Let it bother you. Let the right thing bother you. I love it because that's exactly what I hope that we get through podcast episodes like this that people are bothered by the intersection. They see these experiences and say, we have to do better. So, something in our tradition has to change. Something yeah. in our vernacular has to change. Something in our doctrine, ha our policies have to change. Yeah. And I think the other thing is, is and I, I've mentioned this, but you know, let people find who they are. We're not going to know right off the bat. We're, we need time to explore and understand and to search because there's, there's all these feelings that we've got to sort through. And it's going to take time. We have to find it. We, so, so give people time. And if they say something like, oh, I'm never going to marry a member of the same sex, then, and if they decide five years down the road that, wow, what was I saying? This is actually more right for me. Give them that ability to adapt and adjust as they learn more about who they are, as they learn to love themselves. Let that happen. It's okay. It's absolutely okay. I love it. Um, I was just recently speaking at a conference, and we did a little meet and greet prior to the conference, and so many lesbian women came up to me and said, we need more stories from women. <laughs> Um, where are all the lesbians? Where That's are my all, question. <laughs> where are all the lesbians? <laughs> what is your advice to that group that so desperately needs validation and love and like-minded and shared experiences? What is your advice to someone who is planning on or not even planning on coming out, yeah. but just trying to figure out who she is? I, I would say find your people, and it might take time. It took me going to Kansas, of all places, to find my people and know it was okay to talk about it and who weren't going to judge you. But even more than that, boy, trust the younger generation. Holy cow, there is so much love and acceptance, and they literally don't care and once you feel that, then it's, you know, all the wall's just going to come crumbling down. Once you find one or two people that are like, okay, cool. Um, what do you, where, where, where do you want to go for lunch? Should we, Cafe Rio, does that sound good? Like you, t you come out to them and they don't care. Okay, perfect. Um, so That's now like your what? friend who just didn't, it wasn't a big deal. Not a big deal like, at all. I, I love those types of people. Yes, I do too. Uh, there's going to be fear. There's going to be trepidation. Uh, but try it. Try it and try it, try it. My life is so much more full than it was 10 years ago, than it was, honestly, in any other period of my life. I am the most me. I am the most um, happy. I still want companionship, of course. Of course I do. But I'm in a job that I love. I'm doing theater full time. I'm, I'm f doing film projects on the side. I get to act. I get to write plays. I get to, you know, connect with students. And I get to meet new people all the time. And I have a dog. She's amazing. <laughs> so I would say my advice, find your people. Open up. It's okay. Um, it's hard. I get, I get you. 
I've been there. It's very, very hard. I but want just try it. I want you to find your person. Find your person. Thank you. Oh, you mean thanks, Kyle. Yes, I do too. I do. I absolutely want. <laughs> so if nothing else, if we get something out of this podcast episode, is that we find Paige's <laughs> wife. <laughs> I am fine with that. That's no problem. I didn't come on here to try to find someone, but um, neither yes. did I. But that will that is <laughs> that's now the goal. My that's what goal. we're doing. It's it's just it is. I don't understand, and I've had these conversations with my friends. Um, we women who are gay, or however you identify, uh, there aren't big pods of us. I don't know why. I don't understand that, but. But I've found my gay peeps, and we hang out, and, and it's wonderful. So I, it's okay. Talk about it. You're okay. And, and if anybody needs to reach out to me, you can, and I will help you through. I will listen. I'll be a listening ear I like my friends were for me. Yes, that's super good advice, and it's something I always encourage at the end of every episode to to have that conversation. It's exactly why I like um, having real-time conversations in the as we premiere these episodes, just so people can meet each other and, yeah. and meet at the storefront of, of idea. What haven't we talked about? What did you want to cover? Is there something in, that we, just, just we didn't discuss thing. that, that yeah. you wanted to bring up? I recently, I, I'm, I'm a theater person, so I, I love musicals and plays, and I'm just very inspired and drawn to all of those. And just recently, a couple of weeks ago, uh, the play, the musical Tick, Tick, Boom was released on Netflix, and it was um, an early musical by Jonathan Larson who wrote Rent, which if you haven't seen that, it's great, LGBTQ friendly all over the place, up one side and down the other. It's amazing. That's one way to get your gay card back if there it's been you taken away is watch yes. Rent. If you don't see Rent, give me that card back. Sorry, bye-bye. Uh, so Jonathan Larson and uh, Lin-Manuel Miranda, who wrote Hamilton, directed this kind of modified version of this play. It was kind of an unfinished musical because he spent a lot of time on Rent uh, and he passed away right before it opened on Broadway. So Jonathan Larson had so much to say, but we didn't get... We, the, the things that we got from him are marvelous. He was taken too soon, you know, he just he left too soon. We need more from him. So I was watching... Um, Tick, tick, boom. Right after my play closed, my one of my dear friends from Kansas drove down, and we were watching it together. And it was late. It was like 10 p.m., and, you know, the next day, my friend was going to drive to Dallas and go see the, the gay community in Dallas, and and I was going to get ready for my trip here to Utah. And, and I just said, let's, let's watch Tick, Tick, Boom. I don't know much about it. So the two of us just started watching it, and wow, so many profound things in that little musical. Uh, amazing. If you haven't seen it, watch it. It's beautiful. But there was a phrase that just kept smacking me in the face over and over again. It was one of the final songs in the musical. And the lyrics uh, said, uh, cages or wings, which do you prefer? Ask the birds. And I couldn't stop thinking about that. And I thought, well, you know, okay, let's apply it to us. Closets or wide open spaces, which do you prefer? Ask the LGBTQ community, and we will tell you the wide open spaces is where we always should have been. We never should have been in the closet, but we were. So ask us, and we'll tell you this is why we come out. This is why we talk about it. You know, some people have said over the years, you know, you just, you, if you're not living the gay lifestyle, whatever that means, you don't have to talk about it. You don't have to come out. You don't have to identify. But then I'm just stuck back in that closet. And I deserve to walk around just like you. So I say to you, all of you, closets are wide open spaces. Let me tell you, wide open spaces, that, that is where we belong. And that's what I wanted to share. I love it. Paige, thank you. Thank you, Kyle. This has been just... Wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. It's been wonderful for me. I was freaking out, but I feel good, really good. Thank you. I, I just think there's uh, this is an episode full of such great advice that is uh, just so meaningful to so many uh, sections of our community. Um, so thank you. Thank you for giving us an hour of your time. 
thank you for sharing your fun stories <laughs> and your joy. I mean, it's often said that there's no happiness on this side of the aisle. Watch this episode. I'm happy. Look at look at you. I see happiness. I, it's I, it's the most full, happy, joyful I've felt in my whole life. And audience, I think the most important part of us helping Paige increase her happiness <laughs> is we need to find her a wife. Okay. That's not something I do often on this on this podcast. So, thanks, Kyle. Appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I. Honestly, I, I just have really enjoyed this episode, and I, I thank you for um, quasi-inviting me to lunch <laughs> right. to make sure we got this episode done. Absolutely. Paige, anything else? I think I covered it. I think I did, and I thank you for giving me this platform and this opportunity to talk and share, and um, it's just this podcast has changed me for the better. It has given me strength. It has become my scripture, like I told you. This is this is where I go to get my spiritual energy and growth. And without you and without all those who have shared, I, I don't think I would be as far as I am today. So thank you to all those who've gone before me. Thank you to you, Kyle. You will never know all the good you've done. Oh, thank you. Now you're going to make me cry. <laughs> Join me, please. It's fun. <laughs> Paige, again, thank you for sharing your story. It's another episode of Latter-Gay Stories Podcast. We thank you for giving us an hour of your time to better understand this intersection of sexuality and reality. If you uh, have been touched by, felt something, uh, inspired through Paige's story, we invite you to share this episode. If you are watching on our video version, click our share button on Facebook or uh, comment on our YouTube channel. It's those simple uh, methods by just sharing, commenting, liking, uh, that we are, are able to uh, share messages like this to a, water, a wider and more broad audience. So we, we invite you to do that. Also, if you haven't uh, subscribed to our uh, channel through uh, YouTube or uh, accepted a Facebook like on the Latter-day Stories Facebook page, we invite you to do that as well. There's a whole community of people here, um, as Paige talked about, who want to share in your experience. And if you are listening on the audio version, we invite you to subscribe to this channel. We are everywhere you find your favorite audio podcasts on uh, Apple, iTunes, uh, Google Play, Stitcher, iHeartMedia, and so many other places as well. So we invite you to subscribe to the channel. And as soon as episodes just like this one are released, you are the first to know. Again, we want to thank you for giving us uh, this opportunity. And again, as we talked about, this is our maiden voyage in our brand new Latter-Gay Story studio. We hope you've enjoyed it. We hope you enjoy the upgrades. I just, as a personal note, want to thank our many, many monthly donors who made this possible. It's because of, of uh, generous and kind people like yourself who have contributed to the Latter-Gay Stories uh, podcast and platform that made um, this, this episode uh, possible and future episodes as well. It is um, a labor of love where literally nobody here is paid to do this. It, it really comes from a desire to reach out to the LGBTQ community and let them know that they're not alone, that you're not broken, and that your best days are ahead. That is why we do what we do. And so thank you for joining us in, in this hour and for experiencing Paige's story and, and most importantly, seeing where it goes from here and seeing where your story goes from here as well. So thank you. Again, um, the Latter-Gay Stories podcast is, is your opportunity to better understand this intersection of sexuality and reality, but most importantly, it's stories just like yours that help us to continue writing our own Latter-Gay Stories. <laughs>